let's reset this. And then I will say, is it up on the screen too? Because that would be an exem example of retrograde. Hi, welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Amado Oland. These are members of the Radford Singers, and we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the role of ostinato in establishing form in choral ensemble improvisation. What is choral ensemble improvisation? Well, if you know me at all, you know that I like to do this impro improvisational thing where I get around a bunch of singers, we make some stuff up, and we go. And so I had an interest in how we can make that good. And so I wrote this. I'd like to read it to you now. If you're anything like me, you're interested in musical events that are compelling. Is that, am I up there? Okay. Let's just do a quick check on that. I'm not going to worry over much about this. It should be true of music prepared deliberately in advance or improvised in the moment. Success in creating such uh, a musical event may depend on a thorough, nuanced understanding of a vast myriad of ways that music works. For example, harmonically, rhythmically, melodically, that is having to do with phrase structure, uh, texturally, that is the way the parts are combined, dynamically maybe, uh, and formally, that is in terms of its larger scale organization. And this last topic, form, is the one that I really wanted to take a close look at for today's investigation. As I mentioned, one of my main interests is improvisation, specifically choral improvisation, which includes a practice called circle singing. This is a method of music making pioneered by Grammy award-winning vocalist uh, Bobby McFerrin and members of his vo vocal group Voicestra. The method uses improvisation to generate musical ideas, and those are turned into, okay. Hey. This will work. We'll make it up as we go along. Thank you for giving me the chance to do that joke. Sorry. No, it's good. Uh, right, the method, circle singing. Uh, what they do is they improvise to generate musical material. They turn those into loops or ostinati, and then they assign singers in their circle singing chorus the different parts that they come up with, the different loops they come up with, by alternating. Since generating ostinato figures and subjecting them to uh, processes is one of the way, main ways music is made in circle singing, we can better understand the form of these pieces by understanding how the use of ostinato and procedural transformation influences, and in some cases determines, formal organization in other types of music. So it's not so much a question of navigating the paradox between in-the-moment creation and the shaping of a larger event in time. Neither is it a question of developing strategies for making a circle singing sound event fit into one of the other formal categories we recognize from the repertoire, song form, sonata, theme and variations, etc. Rather, it's about understanding and describing the form or forms that naturally result from the use of ostinati in other musical practices and in circle singing. To describe them well may give audiences uh, the tools to better appreciate circle songs in performance. To understand them well may give the improvising vocalists the tools to use those forms more effectively to make the kinds of compelling, impactful, meaningful musical events that we're all interested in. In case that starts working, I'll move this forward a bit. For purposes of this discussion, we're going to want to have a clear un understanding of what is meant by just a few terms, so now we've got some definitions to talk about. We're going to briefly discuss improvisation, ostinato, and musical form. <coughs> Improvisation, by one definition, is the creation or performance of something spontaneously or without preparation, or making something from whatever is available. An area for further study that's outside of the scope of this investigation is uh, the idea of improvisation in media other than music, say in dance or uh, in theater, or even outside of the performing arts. The example of an improvised engineering solution, a fix designed with limited resources that are easily to hand in the style of the television character MacGyver, will be a useful analogy later on in this presentation. First, let's take up the question of spontaneous creation in music. Music is, 
by its very nature, structure. By one definition, music is organized sounds and silences. Thus, organization is one of its defining characteristics, and sounds and silences are the things organized. The term improvisation calls up an image of unconstrained freedom, but in fact, all musical improvisation takes place within a greater or lesser degree of structure. Sometimes that structure is explicit and constrained, as in the case of a typical jazz improvisation on a standard. Uh, in such a performance, the harmonic structure of the original standard or song is retained over multiple repetitions. The chart becomes how the performers stay on the same page. But even in cases where no explicit structure is predetermined, the musical improviser spontaneously creates not only the surface details, the pitches and the durations of the notes selected, but also tacitly some structures by what scale or pitch system is used tonally and how different note durations relate to one another metrically. To improvise is not only to make up sounds and silences, it's to spontaneously organize them. And although it's not the primary focus of this presentation, note that this points to a solution to the seeming paradox between in-the-moment creation and the planning of larger form. Musical form, this is disappointing. I had some really good jokes to show you on the screen. <laughs> musical form, according to Richard Middleton, is simply the shape or structure of the musical work. The simplicity and intuitiveness of that definition belies the vast variety of structures we find in music. Form operates on many levels, at the level of passage or melody, at the level of, uh, level of a piece, and at the level of a cycle of pieces or a collection of pieces. Here we'll be primarily concerned with uh, the piece level. Representative forms include strophic, that would be A, A prime, A double prime, etc. Binary, A, B, A, B, A, B. Ternary, A, B, A. Rondo, A, B, A, C, A. <clears throat> Theme and variations, and sonata. Once we know what form a piece of music conforms to, we have an expectation of what will occur at different signposts along the performance of the piece. And we can listen for the details of those events as part of the way that we organize and understand our experience of the piece. Put somewhat differently by Percy Scholes, and this is kind of key to this presentation, so I'll say this slowly because it's not up on the screen. Uh, Percy Scholes, in the 10th edition of the Oxford Companion to Music, said musical form is, quote, a series of strategies designed to find a successful mean between the opposite extremes of unrelieved repetition and unrelieved alteration, unquote. As ostinato is one of the foundational procedures uh, in circle singing, there's a risk of unrelieved repetition. We'll look at the degree to which layering complementary ideas, removing old ones and adding new ones, relieves the repetition alluded to here. Ostinato, definition of ostinato. In its simplest form, it's a bit of musical material that continually repeats. The repeating idea may be a motif or phrase, a rhythmic pattern, part of a tune, or a complete melody. By strict definition, an ostinato should have exact repetition, but the term is commonly used more loosely to cover repetitions with various kinds of variation and development. This looser definition of ostinato will provide much of the basis for our ability to compare form in circle singing to form in certain other musical practices. In some kinds of music, form results from the process of submitting ostinato patterns to one or more procedures. Let's take a closer look at how that has operated historically in other traditions of music, and then look at how it operates in circle singing. I'm gonna try something here. Okay. Ah, this again. Okay, so, historical models. First, ground bass, or basso ostinato. Some musical forms from the 17th century, late Renaissance through the Baroque periods, including styles called passacaglia and chazzone, were based on an ostinato bass line or ground bass, over which, hey! Yes. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you. Lee Tolly, everybody. Every once in a while, we should sing the unsung heroes. Uh, ground bass. 
Pescaglia, Chazzone, uh, based on an ostinato baseline or ground base over which variations would unfold. While there are many examples of composed works in this style, where the upper parts are um, written out in advance, there was also a tradition at the time of improvising, hey, improvising uh, these variations over the fixed basso ostinato. A tradition with obvious uh, uh, parallels to circle singing. So let me show you something. I'm going to show you something. Hey, look at that. So functionally, basso ostinato provided or implied a harmonic structure. Some pieces are based on ostinati just one measure long, such as Claudio Monteverdi's 1650 version of Letatius Letatus Sum, there it is. Most have repeating bass figures of three to five measures long. The notable Passacogli and Fugue in C minor, BWV 582 by J.S. Bach, uses an eight measure long ground. But obviously, the most recognizable example is Johann Pachelbel's ubiquitous Canon in D. We're all familiar with the bass melody and the gradual unfolding of the three voice canon that occurs over that ground. Here, it's been transposed to F major to accommodate our baritones. The form that results from this musical device or procedure, improvisation over a basso, basso ostinato, is usually referred to as variation form. The basso ostinato of such pieces provides a repetitive harmonic basis over which a continually evolving uh, structure unfolds. And while we don't have a keyboardist here to demonstrate the authentic 17th century practice, a short demonstration of an adaptation to circle singing practice of this idea will prove relevant to this presentation. So, let's sing. What are, but what am I hoping we'll notice there? What I'm hoping we'll notice is that um, the idea of this ground base that keeps on going, this underpinning harmonic structure, uh, back in the day, back in the uh, 17th century, uh, it would be, that would be going on and the uh, performer would be improvising a keyboard part over the top of that, continuously uh, evolving melodic ideas. Just, it keeps going over whatever the ground is. In uh, the choral improvisation practice, we have uh, this process of doing duets, and so I thought that it would be interesting to see. I think I think what we're, what I sought to illustrate was the idea of continuing continuously unfolding unrelieved alteration over that ground base. Um, neither one of us really had a plan for it was going to go, only that we were going to keep going. There, so. Uh, that's an example from ground bass and maybe how observing this model in other forms of music can inform what we do in circle singing. Let's talk about some fugue. Uh, 
this piece we've just sang is a uh, fortuitous example because in its original composed form by Coppelbell, it employs a musical procedure in the upper three voices, canon, that is a subset of the musical procedure of the fugue. Let's use the more uh, permissive definition of the term ostinato and view the fugue as a method that treats an ostinato, the fugue subject, to certain procedures and transformations. The structure of resulting pieces, while not a um, sectional form like binary or um, sonata, falls into recognizable patterns that listeners can use as a basis for understanding and appreciating a piece. According to musicologist Alfred Mann, fugue is not a form per se, it is primarily a method of composition that has sometimes taken on certain structural conventions. So we note here briefly uh, the features of that structure. An exposition which presents the listener with the subject entries sequentially in three or four voices, usually in two different key areas. A development section which alternates episodes of free counterpoint with subject entries and a final recapitulation of the original fugue subject. The goal of noticing this structure is not to try to replicate it within the context of uh, circle singing procedure, but rather to observe how that overall structure is a result of the musical procedures that, uh, that the fugue subject is put through. But episodes of free counterpoint, followed by a repeat of a familiar melody, that might be worth remembering. Let's jump forward about 150 years and keep with our permissive use of the term ostinato and look at 12-tone serial technique of writing music pioneered by Arnold Schoenberg and practiced by his students Alvin Berg and Anton Weber. These and other members of the so-called Second Viennese School sought ways to organize pitch information uh, that was, that's not based on a hierarchy of pitch relationships. In other words, not tone-centered. The 12-tone serial technique they developed was certainly procedural. Let's discuss whether there is a sense in which it was also ostinato-based. Anyone who has studied a 12-tone serial piece of music has identified the order in which the 12 chromatic notes appear in the piece and has filled out one of those 12 by 12 matrix that shows the full array of pitch organization choices available to the composer for that piece. Uh, this original order of the 12 tones, called the tone row, in its prime form, <coughs> could be construed as the foundational ostinato of the piece. This sequence of pitches, or more properly, the sequence of intervallic relationships that comprise it, is subject to pitch transpositions and intervallic inversion, forward and in retrograde, and any rhythmic transformation the composer requires. Um, Hey. Indeed, this foundation can be so transformed as to be difficult to remember what thought you were supposed to say next. And so as to be difficult to uh, recognize orally within the piece. Nonetheless, there is a sense in which the nature of this ostinato and the procedures it is subjected to have implications for the form of 12-tone serial music. Just as organizational forms that we find in tonal music are implications of the features of tone-centeredness itself. Composers of the Second Viennese School sought formal organizations that were implications of the tone rows that they used. They recognized that, for example, sonata form would make no sense in music that lacks a pitch-centered harmonic sense of rest, departure, tension, and resolution. So while they were free to use any large-scale organization they wished, they often organized pieces in ways that reflected aspects of the tone row or brought those aspects to light. One example would be an arch form or a palindromic structure if the source pitch material was somehow similar backwards and forwards. But there are much more explicit examples of the use of ostinato in the 20th and 21st centuries in the school of composing referred to as minimalism, exemplified by composers such as Steve Reich and Terry Riley. We'll note how musical procedure begets form in two pieces, Clapping Music by Steve Reich and In C by Terry Riley. Steve Reich's Clapping Music is a piece entirely constructed of a single measure, non-tonal rhythmic ostinato. It's a clapping pattern, 12 eighth notes in length with strategically placed claps and rests intended for two performers. 
after every eight repetitions of this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to botch the asthana, but I'm going to try it for you. I think it's... Any percussionists in the room who can validate or refute that? It's a good thing I'm safe. So that's the pattern. And uh, after every repetition of this pattern, it's got two people clapping it. Uh, after every eight repetitions, one of the two offsets it by one eighth note, creating a different interacting pattern between the two parts. Not all minimalistic pieces are procedural, but this one is. This offsetting procedure defines its entire evolution. This piece is an example of Reich's phase music. The procedural nature of this piece does more than just suggest its form. It determines it. As the ostinato is 12 eighth notes long and is offset by one eighth note each time, there are 12 possible combinations between the two performers. They start and end in unison. I think this is good to look at. Start and end in unison, and in both the second and the penultimate section, one performer is one eighth note ahead of the other, and so forth as you work your way on towards the middle. The result is an arch form. It goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. Terry Riley's in C employs ostinato in almost entirely different ways and with much more determinacy left up to the performers. Uh, the definition I have here says that the score consists of 53 separate modules. Each of these modules, uh, end quote, each of these modules then can be construed as an ostinato due to the instruction to play each a number of times. But the entrance and the repetition of the ostinato is left up to the performer's choices, either in advance or uh, as an improvisational choice during performance. Nonetheless, there's much about the resulting musical structure or form that is determined, and we can trace the ways in which the procedure of the piece shapes the form. Per the performance instructions, um, the piece will always open with the first module, played several times, and it will always end with the last one, and the middle sections will always be somewhere near the middle. The overall texture will be as the quote describes, um, a web of overlapping module statements. So we could not describe the piece as strictly sectional, nor as a kind of variation form, but we would describe the kind of gradual evolution or unfolding that it undergoes. And we could see how that unfolding is a consequence of the procedural treatment Riley defines on the ostinati modules that he wrote. <coughs> now, with all this as background, we're prepared to observe how the procedural nature of circle singing works to create the form of the pieces thus created. But first, we must describe what some of those procedures are. To that end, I have done something that, ironically enough, is antithetical to the improvisational nature of circle singing. I have improvised you something in advance. Uh, and written it down as it might occur as if uh, it were really being done in the moment. Uh, I was able to produce a limited number of full scores, and some of you may have them. That's more or less what a, uh, a performance of a circle song might look like live. We're going to do something pretty close to what you have in your hands uh, here shortly. Transcribed that way, we can take a slower and more deliberate look at the musical thought processes that the circle song leader has learned to use. In the interest of time, we can't perform this piece twice through in its entirety as we should. Once to just regale you with it, and then after we pick it apart again so that you can hear the pieces. I, I, I'm not sure that would serve. So here's what to listen for on the one time that we do perform it, so that the piece and also the conclusions of this presentation make some sense. Notice, please, how there's a foreground layer of mostly unbelieved uh, alteration and an accompaniment layer of almost unrelieved repetition. Notice how the first ostinato that gets set in the baritones provides or implies a harmonic structure. Observe the way that the texture evolves in the beginning as the um, initial context is being built. And then after a period where they remain static during some foreground episodes of melodic exploration, the texture then becomes a web of overlapping ostinati, changing over to a chorale texture. Enjoy.
So it is
fair representation of what might happen in an actual circle singing event. Uh, fair enough for our purposes so we can take a look at what just happened and what the procedure behind it was and how the result was organized and how that organization is a consequence of the procedure. Uh, the first four measures of the transcription that some of you have in your hands represents the first stage in that process. Uh, the leader's exploration of some musical material in search of some that is somehow right for the moment, according to criteria that is generally highly particular to the leader. This is sometimes referred to as singing your way into it, and it may be as long or as short as is required for the leader to find music that they're prepared to commit to for the next few minutes. Singers sometimes find what needs to be expressed according to the dictates of their inner reality, other times they find it in the circumstances that brought the circle singing chorus together for the occasion. Sometimes they find it MacGyver-esque in the found sounds and incidental noises in situ. We've learned, however, to make our music musical almost as soon as we commit to opening our mouth to sing. Aimless noodling is counterindicated because this material must serve double duty as the musical foreground. Uh, in measure five of the transcription, the leader has settled on a musical material that they want to hear repeated as the first ostinato, ostinato building block of the improvised piece. And it's worth breaking off here as briefly as possible to discuss the criteria that may be used in the, in the uh, selection or, criteria, or, or creation of these ostinato parts. Really, the point here isn't to try to teach you how to circle sing, but I think this is, um, this is important information to know. The circle song leader has learned to categorize or compartmentalize ostinati according to their musical features and how they might function in the context of a musical texture. Textural organization is another one of the details that needs to be uh, created without preparation. So to navigate this task, the experienced leader has prepared themselves with conceptions of different components that they can employ. Uh, mixing and matching to create the kind of texture that they desire for a given moment of music. The list of components is not universal. It varies somewhat by individual. Uh, and they consist of descriptions of features and functions rather than decrees or definitions. Still, it gives the leader the tools they need to rapidly think about how they want their next musical gesture shaped. And here's the list of components. The one with reasonably, this is one list, and it's one with a reasonably broad adoption within the community of practice of circle singers worldwide. First, we've got the motor, which is an initial looping part with enough tonal information to start to indicate possible tonalities, enough rhythmic information to indicate possible meters, and enough space between the notes to admit a complementary part. Second, interlock, a complementary looping part that fills in some or most of the space left by the motor and leaves free most of the space taken up by the motor. The motor and the interlock together are sometimes referred to as a two-voice engine. Contrast a looping part that is contrasting in character to the parts that came before, often more lyrical, where the previous parts have been rhythmically propulsive. Harmony, uh, parallel usually, uh, harmony on an existing part in the texture. Anchor, a, lo a looping part often in a lower register that reinforces and clarifies the tonal and rhythmic center of the piece. Many motor parts are anchoring, but they needn't be, and if a piece has got a lot of uh, performers in it or a lot of parts in it, an anchor might want to be added later uh, to reinforce those tonal and metric centers. Vocal percussion sometimes figures as a feature of this music and functions as a rhythmic reinforcement and punctuation of melodic phrase. And last but not least, certainly not least, melody, an opportunity for an individual singer to sing a non-looping through line that starts someplace, brings the listener through a melodic development to someplace else. There, that's about as briefly as I can do that. With those components defined, we're ready to go back to the transcription and discuss the song leader's thought process. In measure five, the leader has decided on a suitable motor part with strong anchoring features. Uh, this example assumes an SATB choir rather than a larger SSATBB choir, and it also assumes a desire for expediency in the moment, and no strong need to open with tonal ambiguity that will be clarified later. So notice here how a rhythmic motif there. Clear tonality. So this one assumed, hey, let's just make this anchoring right out of the gate. <clears throat> um, 
Notice here how a motif from the original melodic exploration has been mined uh, to, uh, to, to, to be part of the motor. And this is a strategy that's used to create a unity or a consistency in the musical language of this particular piece. So that was just It's that do figure that got mine for I think we can hear that. Notice also that this short loop provides us with a simple implied harmony, not unlike what happened in the basso continuo in the 17th century. And that's worth listening to. Let's build that. Um, I'm actually not going to give you your interlocking parts from before. We're just going to do the uh, bass loop. If you've got the combined score, this next section appears in measure 15. Uh, some people have got uh, some of the more detailed uh, view here. Not terribly important. Once the motor has been repeated enough times that the baritones have, uh, can, can have learned it and taken it up, the leader again goes on a, through a short episode of exploration. This serves double duty as musical foreground, melody, and as the working out of a suitable interlock part to form a two voice engine with the motor. In measure 21, the song leader has uh, settled on the desired interlock part. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> and it re and uh, at that point, the leader repeats it until the tenors are prepared to pick it up. At this point, the song leader might be acutely conscious of the danger of accumulating too much unrelieved repetition. So without engaging in another exploratory period, they're ready for the interlock part to be reinforced by the addition of a parallel harmony on it. So I jumped right to the altos and gave them that. Shortly after that, this was the result. I'll mention in passing that this piece is settled on an alien mode uh, with no mode mixture and no chromaticism. Those things aren't impossible in, in circle singing. Uh, that's just the way that this particular piece happened to come out and I think appropriate for the purposes of this piece. Uh, right, so notice how the interlock works uh, works with the motor. The interlock is active while the motor is static or resting, and vice versa. Now let's hear it. <laughs> In your combined score, it, it's accomplished in 36 measures. Measure 37 starts another exploratory episode, but employs another strategy to relieve the repetition of the established ostinati. By indicating to the sopranos that they are to echo um, the motif expressed by the leader, this section can do triple duty. It serves as musical foreground, it finds its next ostinato, and it varies the process by which that next ostinato is found. The leader is, in this example, starting to think of what kind of contrast part will fit well with the existing texture. Therefore, an additional musical thought process is, is occurring here. Um, consideration of melodic phrase structure. The song leader is more conscious of starting pitches, 
melodic contour, ending pitches, and how each phrase follows from the one previous. 16 measures later, the leader has settled on uh, a contrasting part and indicates to the sopranos that they should stop the two-measure echo response that they've been doing. Here we can see how the episode of melodic exploration has been mined for the features of the contrast. Let's see, yeah. Uh, this rhythmic figure from the beginning of that exploration became the rhythmic figure there. That was copied exactly over to that spot. And last but not least, that was copied exactly to that spot. Which, so there you can see um, how the episode of melodic exploration has been mined for the features of the contrast part. Yet one more example of how melodic foreground turns into contextual ostinato. Once this ostinato is set in the sopranos, we start another section. If you have a combined score, this information is on measure 69. This is way too much uh, to include on one illustration, so we're not, our point isn't to look at it in detail. Uh, this section has the least to do with ostinato, which is the topic of today, so we don't have to dwell on these details for this presentation. But this section does deserve mention because in many ways it's the heart of this improvised piece. All of the contextual parts have been set, and all of the melodic explorations thus far have been setting the stage for this information, the true melodic statement of this piece. If the contrast part in the soprano line were a little less detail rich, the leader might have left it going as part of the accompaniment texture and sang a 16 or 32 measure melody on top of it. As it is, the leader wanted more room in the texture, so he used the contrast part as a four bar refrain alternating uh, with the melodic statement. As for the details of that statement, suffice it to say that the leader was considering starting and ending scale degrees of each phrase, contour of each phrase, how each phrase relates to the one before, and to the refrain me melody, and finally some of the rhythmic motifs that, that had emerged in previous foreground episodes. They might have considered doing phrase repetition or sequencing, but those features didn't emerge as part of this particular uh, expressive statement. Once this melodic statement has been made, and the leader has also decided that the song duration has about hit its limit, all that remains is a denouement and an ending. This too could have been handled any number of ways. Um, fortuitously for our purposes, they did not simply elect to cue the sopranos to stop, and then the baritones leaving the inner two voices in a homophonic texture for a few repetitions and then stop that. It gives us an opportunity to look at uh, what happened instead. This would have been a perfectly viable option, this one I just described. But here the song leader uh, decided to do a texture change from this to, watch closely, that. This gives us a chance to compare this passage and the ending section of the music to uh, the web of overlapping module statements that we see in Terry Riley's In C. In your combined score, you'll see this in measure 105. The leader removes the altos from the har their harmony in the two-voice engine, gives them a parallel harmony on the soprano part. So far, not a dramatic change in texture. There are still three things going, that two-voice engine plus the contrast. Uh, the weight has just shifted from the interlock part to the contrast. But on removing the baritones, at that point, only the ghost of the two-voice engine still remained in the tenor's interlock. When the baritones join in on another parallel harmony on contrast, it's clearly in transition to a chorale texture. Rather than dwell on the transition, the leader finds some inner voice harmony notes for the tenors to sing, arrives at the chorale texture, cues a final crescendo and retardando, and they bring a piece to a dramatic and wonderful close, and the crowd goes wild. So, let's get some conclusions from all of this stuff. We've answered two of the questions that I pose immediately after our performance of the song. We've described what happened and what the procedure was that begat it. We should now be able to see what the large-scale formal organization of this piece is and how that organization is a natural consequence of the procedure. The most facile comparison is to the 17th century basso continuo music. In choral improvisation formats, such as circle singing, the role of the basso ostinato is taken by one or more parts, such as the motor or anchor or two-voice engine that establish and or elaborate on a pitch set and harmonic progression. And the role of free improvisation over that harmonic context is taken up by 
the episodes of melodic exploration. But where basso continuo is a variational form, pieces created by this choral improvisation procedure can be thought of as having sections based on which subroutine the song leader is unfolding at a given time. Today's example had four. Build to voice engine, call and echo to build the contrast, melody and refrain, transition to the new texture. However, there is little in the surface detail of this piece that really indicated to the listener that a new section had begun, so the listening experience is not dramatically affected by this sectioning. Further, the process of each subroutine was similar. Episodes of foreground melodic expo exploration giving way to ostinato, which is, by necessity, repeated until, um, repeated until learned by a section, and then only then may the music move on to new complementary ideas. So, circle song form is not entirely a variational form. What about fugue? While fugue doesn't use its fugue subject as relentlessly as the ostinati in circle singing, there is a point of comparison in the alternating episodes and theme restatements in the development section of Fugue. The free counterpoint of the episodes is analogous to the free melodic exploration of singing your way into it, and serves a similar function of exploring the melodic and harmonic space of the piece. In a fugue, these are punctuated by a return to the familiar theme restatement. In a circle song, these are often followed by an ostinato phrase that emerges from the exploration. Twelve-tone serial technique mostly serves as a counterexample. While successful composers of that second Viennese school often organize their pieces around the features of the tone rows that they used, that remained the composer's choice, and they were free to uh, choose whatever form they thought was best for the, that best served the piece. Is the tone row an ostinato? It repeats throughout the piece ceaselessly, but transformed each time in pitch, in inversion, in direction, and in rhythm. It may be an ostinato, but it is not a surface feature, so it's function, it functions more as an organizing principle. Clapping music, at least, has some surface DNA in common with circle singing. The ostinato is pure surface detail, stripped down to non-tonal rhythmic relationships. Reich's procedure could easily be borrowed uh, by the circle singing process, but in clapping music, both the surface detail and the transformational process is far more if you'll pardon the word choice, minimalistic. Terry Riley's In C is a much richer point of comparison. They both consist of overlapping ostinati, and they both project a gradual evolution of a web of ostinato statements, especially during those times when uh, the circle song leader is in the midst of changing a texture. Riley's procedure uh, allows for seamless transition from texture to texture, as all of his modules are written down in advance. Choral improvisation, by contrast, introduces new musical information at intervals that seem haphazard to listeners unfamiliar with circle singing procedure. The form that we have described for a uh, circle song has optional episodes of melodic exploration, which turn into ostinati, which form the basis or context for additional episodes or layering. It, it can optionally be quasi-sectional, based on whether the leader decides to unfold more than one process, building a texture, using the, uh, that texture to present melody, or changing a texture. So there's the form that results from, these piece, uh, from this process. Uh, this formal organization is, in fact, shaped by the procedures of choral improvisation, just as those procedures are shaped by the challenges and opportunities of improvising multiphonic music with multiple monophonic instruments. Members of the circle singing community have grappled with varying degrees of success with making improvised choral pieces in other forms, such as rondo or sectional song form. All must deal with the essential fact that the parts of these songs don't exist in advance. Parts must be repeated so that they can be taught, and once taught, they must be repeated so that other parts can be added to them. As a result, choral improvisation often seeks to find a mean between unrelieved repetition and unrelieved alteration uh, by putting these two extremes in different layers of the music, accompaniment background versus melodic foreground, respectively. But this doesn't mean we have to limit our understanding of the possibilities within these formal constraints. 
Taking inspiration from some of the uh, historical models on this slide, we can investigate what made basso continuo a successful form. Maybe the length or complexity of the harmonic uh, information presented by that basso ostinato melody. And incorporate as many of those elements in the circle singing procedure as naturally fit. We can investigate what makes the song in C uh, such a compelling piece. This presentation has placed focus on the components often used for choral improvisation, but the procedure does not limit us to using those components. We could easily dispense with foreground melodic exploration and base an entire piece on the one subroutine of continuously replacing ostinati one section after another. Or we could borrow from, from Reich and limit ourselves to just one ostinato, but transform it incrementally as we give it to subsequent sections. The necessities of the procedure largely determine the shape of the bucket. What we put in the bucket is up to us. It's up to us to learn about the possibilities within the limitations of the form so that we may choose, in the moment, the right strategy or procedure for that moment. And with that, I'm going to let Stravinsky have the last word here. My freedom will be so much the greater and more meaningful the more narrowly I limit my field of action and the more I surround myself with obstacles. Whatever diminishes constraints, diminishes strength. The more constraints one imposes, the more one frees one's self of the chains that shackle the spirit. Thank you. Did I do that in a half an hour? Would you like to hear more circle singing? Hey folks, we get to do it for real. I think this is useful and relevant to the discussion because it gives us now an opportunity to see whether we can hear some of those formal aspects in something that we make up right here and now. We'll just do one because we've got the time and uh, then we'll uh, let you free. How do we feel? Ah, let's find something in situ. Let's use something that we find right here in the room. Will somebody please give me one word for a concept or an idea, an emotion, an experience? Just give me something to go on. This is called a get. Improvisational circles call this a get. Somebody. Confluence. Confluence. Somebody give me a word I can easily define. Confluence. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Structure? Structure. structure. <laughs> what does structure sound like? Let's find out. Yeah. 
implications of form in, in this. Um, it's, it's been uh, the sort of thing that I've struggled with this. How do I make a compelling piece of music out of this, out of this format? Do I understand enough about music to, to use it in the moment to, uh, to, to present something like this? And, uh, and the work continues. Uh, the Radford Singers Choir, and under the direction of Dr. Bowen, has been a fantastic support structure for this exploration at this institution. I am deeply indebted to um, the, the semesters that we've worked together and looking forward to uh, continuing to work. I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Dr. Mahan for his um, guidance throughout my process as a composer and also as an academic, and uh, Dr. McDonald for her um, sound advice on all things and um, uh, encouragement to become the, um, the academic and the educator that uh, I hope to one day be. Thank you again and enjoy your evening. Thanks.